Welcome back to the Wyoming Kansas City podcast. Um, am I hosting? Are you hosting? Um, I'm this open your to whatever. <laughs> Can we start over really quick? Sorry, no, this I is know. Great. <laughs> this is what I'm going for. I was looking for some. We're gonna have a timer today, so we, we're gonna just go for. We're like going three hours. forever, dude. Okay, let's do it. What are you go doing on. next? You got lunch plans? Uh, my wife asked that I would actually come <laughs> home a little early for lunch today. All right, we'll do it because she's got a prayer meeting that she needs to be on with a bunch of. A bunch wow, of ladies, great so. prayer. Prayer is a great excuse for. It is a good excuse. We'll cut the podcast short for prayer. There you go. No, we're uh, you've been running this podcast like this has been your gig, dude. And uh, I think where we're headed with this is just really opening it up and trying to create more conversations around here. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty new to the scene. Yeah, I'm brand new staff here. But I, uh, I think we're both today hosting in a way. But I've got some thoughts. And um, today we're going to be talking about how to become a missionary. Come on. And I think this is a really uh, interesting topic and there's a lot of places we go with it. And uh, so, but I, we have some uh, questions from our audience that we're uh -huh. going to answer later. And uh -huh. so if you have any questions, uh, put them down in the comments. This is going to be, I think, hopefully an ongoing topic mm -hmm. of conversation. This is kind of what we do, mm -hmm. missions and, mm -hmm. and, and even training in missions. And so, um, yeah, you've been, you've been here how long? So since the start, since the start, so I've been in Wyoming since 2009, technically. So I'm getting old, man. And, and then here in Kansas city, our, our campus launched in 2012. So since 2012, man, so Dang. Eight, eight years and, uh, yeah, know some stuff, don't know other things. It's great. So it's been, but it's been a really awesome 10 or 11 years here in YWAM and then eight years here in Kansas city. So it's been fun. Cool. Yeah. I'm like, Barely six months in, but hey. we're figuring it out. I was, but you've been in Wyoming a minute. Yeah, I was in since. Wyoming, Norway uh -huh. um, the last two and a half, three years. Uh -huh. And so, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a journey. It's interesting because YWAM is the same here, but different. Mm -hmm. And I'm still figuring out, like, what is YWAM? Right. No, totally. <laughs> well, yeah, it's unique. And I think it's a lot of people, when they get in YWAM, they're like, okay, well, what is it? And I'm like, well, they have core values. And they're decentralized, so they're all over the place. And every location has the same same values, but it's played out differently. And even some core DNA that could be different based on the location you go. So that's yeah, yeah totally. That's kind of the, the we're going to talk more about that later on. Mm -hmm. But yeah, starting with this question. Actually, before we go there, um, our set's developing back hey, here, guys. We have a fish. I'm just throwing we it out there. Fish. I don't know if you brought this up on your podcast yet. We haven't. But we need to introduce the fish who is currently like on death row. <laughs> <laughs> His name is Mushu. He's a beta fish. And I, like, if you look closely, you won't see him. I think he's hiding behind. I don't think I've ever seen him. I'm just being honest. He's under some that SpongeBob pineapple. But he's uh, he's struggling. I think he's stressed. We put him in like a little fish bowl to mm -hmm. start off with, mm -hmm. and then we were like, "Is it the water warm enough? It's kind of mm -hmm. cold here in Kansas City." And then mm -hmm. we like switched him, and then we were like, "Wait a minute, switching him is like stressful." And it's been like a week, and he's still like, I don't know how if he's gonna hey. make it. Well, you know what? He's there though. Pray he's for still Mushu. alive. <laughs> yeah, pray for Mushu, as voted by our fans online. <laughs> Um, yeah, dude, the, the, the set's looking good. We got trophies. We got Kansas City Chiefs flags, barbecue sauce. That's right. And if, if you have, if you're in the Kansas City area and you want to donate towards our set, if you've got some cool, like bobblehead, something, you know, whatever, like a Lauren Cunningham bobblehead, over. Lauren Cunningham bobblehead, that would, <laughs> that would be amazing. That would change it. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is a kind of, we're developing stuff here. We're figuring out kind of what's going on and mm -hmm. I'm kind of new to this scene. And so I'm learning what what's happening here. Mm -hmm. There's obviously a ton happening out of this training center. Um, it's way bigger than just YWAM here, but obviously YWAM is sort of connected with all of it. And it, as someone who's even here, I'm still figuring out what's going on. And so I, I think today a little bit, but then especially in future podcasts, I wanted to go mm -hmm. through and just kind of talk about who we are and what are the topics that we're, you know, that we focus on or mm -hmm. think about mm -hmm. and kind of explaining and sharing in some of those areas and today talking about how to become a missionary. Mm. Um, and I think this is a question I thought a lot about right. as someone who was like, I think I want to be a missionary. I'm not sure if I want to be a missionary. Am I right. called? Where am I supposed to go? What am I doing? Like, right. and mostly you hear like occasionally you hear an update from a missionary and then mostly you just hear, go, go to the nations, go to the nations, right. this missions call all the time, which is amazing and stirs my heart. Right. But sometimes it's kind of like, 
What does that look like? Or how right. Does that what are the feel? Pre- yeah. What's step one? What's step five? Like, how do I actually get there? What does it look like at all? Yeah. So if I asked you this question, how do how do you like if someone was out there like I want to be a missionary, uh, maybe they're eighteen. Right. How do I become a missionary? What does that look like? Right. What would you say? Yeah, no, I think it's it's a great question, and we have uh, we talk to people regularly with that question actually. So I think. Um, First off, on a big picture level, some people don't even know if they are called or not. And first, just to say that's okay, right? Um, I think that's that's a big one. There's this image sometimes of missions being you're in a mud hut, Africa, holding a baby, you know, you know I don't know, or whatever, and uh, sleeping <laughs> on a dirt floor, and that is the picture of missions. You got, like, naked natives with, like, you know, barely <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. like, walking and, around. And you're there for life, 100% there. Uh you know, and where missions has so many different expressions based off your your calling, your gifts, the needs of the place or the location, and so those are uh, on a bigger picture level a lot of factors there. Um, like ninety nine percent of the missions we see in like a movie or like that we hear about is that kind of missions, right. and I feel like that's probably closer to like one percent of where actual missionaries are, which we need more missionaries there. Yeah. Right. So like absolutely that right. that's a part of it and that's real. Right. But that's not. It's not the full picture. That's not all that missions has to offer. And like, I think for me, I even had that, that image in mind Mm -hmm. of this, like in the middle of nowhere Mm -hmm. with people that don't know Jesus at all being missions. And I think I, now that I'm in it, I realize like, no, it's, there's a whole lot more going on and a whole lot more opportunities. And like, I think for some people that's sort of what their image of missions is. Mm -hmm. And so they're Mm -hmm. asking the question, do I want that? And some people are like, uh, no, <laughs> right. Yeah, no, totally. But, but it's still that, I think that's really helpful to reframe the conversation that it's not, um, as, as like binary as you're out there on the mission field or you're here having a job in that sort of extreme right. perspective. Yeah. Like the, yeah, the extremes and to actually leave room for other things, you know, like, I mean, we have guys even on our campus who are dancers that our hip hop dancers spin on their head and that's actually a version of missions. You're like, how is that a version that, of like, missions? That like reaches people with the gospel. Yeah, reaches people with the gospel in a relevant way, more places than you would think around the planet. Um, or, you know, there's so many different, and then you have like guys that are real smart, <laughs> that are Bible translators that went to school for years and they work for Wycliffe or whatever and they're in a tribe for eight years learning the language, creating an alphabet. I mean, that's like a real extreme version, but there, it's so diverse I think sometimes early on there can be a pressure to want to know, first off, where am I called? What am I supposed to do? How is this supposed to look? Now, I think right out the gate, and we were talking about this a little bit yesterday actually, is to take the pressure off and just take a step, take a step or two, uh, get on the phone with somebody. Hey, what does this look like? Okay, maybe try something a little shorter. Get get your feet on the ground for a couple weeks, a month, three months, six months, whatever it might be. And you actually begin to discover uh, some of the things that God's put inside of you and discover what, okay, what, what does this look like? And it looks like a lot of things, a lot of places. So those yeah. are just initial thoughts here. I, but. I think it's like pretty impossible to figure out if you're one, supposed to be a missionary and two, where and what kind of missions, like sitting on your couch in your hometown mm-hmm. or like going to church in your hometown. Like thinking of it that detached is just really impossible, especially mm-hmm. when you're thinking about it as like a lifetime call. Mm-hmm. And I think that kind of pressure for some people creates this unnecessary. It's like showing up to college and you're like, what's your major? And you're right. like, I don't even know who I am. I don't know what I want to do. I've mm-hmm. never tried this before. And a lot of people get into a, you know, business classes and they're like, actually, I don't want to be a business major. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I think, um, yeah, for me, the answer to that question, like how to become a missionary, I think you got to start with something simpler. You said get on the phone with somebody. I think talking to a missionary is a great idea. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. For most of these missions organizations out there, um, the first step is applying. Mm-hmm. It's like, you, know, you don't think of it. You're thinking like when I apply, like I'm ready and I'm mm-hmm. funded and I know where I want to go and I know what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And I've even maybe been trained for it. Mm-hmm. But really applying is just like saying, hey, let's talk. Like mm-hmm. I want to hear what questions I should be asking. Like, yeah, maybe I should go on a short term trip. Right. And I think for a lot of people trying to figure that out without dialoguing with someone who's in that space or mm-hmm. even actually going somewhere, um, it's pretty impossible. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then I think for a lot of people that are like, this is what I want to do. Maybe they right. even think they do. They know they're like asking the question, like, who am I going with? How do I get trained? All these mm-hmm. questions. It's like, 
maybe you should go. Maybe you think you're, you know what it is, but maybe you should go try it out. Maybe you'll get into that business class and be like, this is not my major, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean that, that, you know, being a missionary is a bad idea. It just means don't, don't like fill in all the blanks before you even start, you know, kind of, yeah, be open. Right. No, that's super good. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and again, tr- yeah, trying things out, I think is a totally awesome thing. Like I think a lot of people get called as they even step out too. Like it wasn't like they had a angelic encounter before they went and they had an audible voice of God. I wish I had an audible voice of God. <laughs> I wish I had that every morning, actually. That'd be super great. But we know the kingdom operates by faith in some ways. And he's called everybody to go in some capacity. So everyone's called to be in be a missionary in one sense of being on mission and reaching people with the gospel. So that's a call to every single person on the planet. So um, where that is and what that looks like, that's sometimes where it takes a little bit to figure it out and yeah. try out different things. And we're talking about more of the foreign context as a traditional occupation. Um, like which, vocational missions. Yeah, like long like vocational. term, you're on the field for like four, 10, 40 years. Yeah, or like that. Wh- whatever it is. Um, and I think um, for that is a, a group of people and I think a growing group of people that so uh, needed. is needed across the planet when you, when you look at you know, a few billion people that either have no access to Jesus or have very little access that really need it. Um, I, I do believe that the number of missionaries there are right now is way less than what God desires in his heart because I believe in his heart he desires that everyone to be reached and we yeah. need more to do that. So what, what do you think is the, like, why do we have so few missionaries? Like, why is it that God's not calling enough people or uh, even using that word calling, but like, right. is it on God's side? The issue, <laughs> yeah. I Why mean, don't we have we have four hundred thousand missionaries? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can go uh, several directions <laughs> theologically with that, depending on where you fall in the camps. But um, I'd, I'd go to Romans ten, maybe, and just keep it real simple. And there's a series of questions there Paul asks, and one of them is, how will basically they go unless they are sent? And and basically, if you haven't heard the call or there's an opportunity to even wow, there's a need in the nations I never even knew. I think people need to hear that. So I think that's one thing on our end, I'll say, that I think God's, uh, as believers in discipleship, um, sometimes I think we focus on um, a lot of other things that are inward, which is great, but the Bible is both uh, inward and it's outward. It's got to be both. Otherwise, you're going to have a lopsided Christianity where you you kind of just stay within the four walls, honestly. And so... Um, I think first off, people even knowing that there's a need out there, actually, there's a need out there. And when people hear it, then I feel like whatever capacity, I think we are called to touch the nations, whether it's us physically on the ground, whether it's funding people, whether it's short term stuff, whether it's connecting with our church that then whatever it is, there's so many versions of it. Um, we're called to reach the people right around us, and we're called to reach the nations because um, that is the great commission Jesus gave to his disciples before he left planet Earth. <laughs> the The last lines he was saying in Acts chapter 1 is basically you're supposed to go to the ends of the earth. Yeah. And and that's for everybody. Which it we just, haven't done yet. And it wasn't really we haven't done. practical for the apostles to make it to every corner of the earth. So yeah. it wasn't they, just for them. Right. Yeah, no. And that's in, that's a thing that's ongoing. Um, and in Matthew 28, you see, he says, and teach them everything I taught you. So it is an ongoing thing. It's, it wasn't just for 12 special apostles that had this these you know this crazy super calling on their life and they were the ones. No, that they, they were called to actually raise up other ones who were then called to raise up other ones. And we now have generations of believers and Christianity has spread and grown over the centuries um, and we're getting closer. Like there's, we actually now have the ability through technology to track and understand how many people groups we've reached on the earth, how many people still need to hear the gospel, how many people still need a church in their community, how many can fill in the blank. And, so. and there is an acceleration, like we are seeing more and more missionaries um, that maybe that's something we'll hit up on a later podcast, gather some numbers there. But um, I think what we're seeing now in missions is very different than what we saw 50 years ago. Mm-hmm. And I think we, again, we still have that image in our head of that person going to the unreached people group, which is so needed. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is kind of, it makes great movie right. um, as well. It makes a great life, right. live for Jesus. But I think for a lot of people, they're kind of like sitting in church, you know, at 15 or 16 and they're mm-hmm. thinking, do I want to do that? Mm-hmm. And they have like a yes or a no. 
And so in my mind, I'm thinking if that's the question that you're asking and mm-hmm. it's that simple, like it's, it's either I'm going to stay here and have a job or I'm going to go do like a really hard thing in a really hard place for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. I think that question or that mm-hmm. approach to it might be one of the reasons why we have less missionaries than I think God is in God's heart yeah, sure. is that I think people it's, it's much bigger of a leap and it's a big commitment. And, you know, even traditionally, if you went 50 years ago, hundred years ago, mm-hmm. um, if you were going to be a missionary, it was kind of like being a pastor, like you had a lot of education, a lot of preparation. Um, and that has not changed in, in one way in that, like, if you want to go to a hard place long-term, you still need a lot of training, right? You still need to learn a language. You still need to, right, you know, right. there's still practical things there. Yeah. But if you take the equation out and saying it's either stay in your home country in your hometown or go to the impossible places, if you start to say, no, it actually can be incremental. And you could say yeah, the entry point is way easier. Right. Yeah. So I like, I'll use a kind of funny example, but I think a very real one, like back 50 years ago or whatever it was, if you wanted to become a missionary is how it, I think typically went, not exactly all the time, but just go with me. Um, you're, in church, you love Jesus a ton. Someone tells you, wow, you should go to seminary because you just love Jesus a lot. Okay, you go to seminary for four years. You're in your third and fourth year at seminary. Wow, you love Jesus a lot and you have a heart for people. Maybe you should become a missionary. Like, okay, after seminary ends, you then go get more missions training for a year, two, three, four. And finally, year six, seven, eight, you get a missionary assignment and you move to another country and you maybe never set foot in a foreign country your entire life, but you had seven years of training. Like that was a vi- that's a very like normal scenario back in the day. Yeah. Whereas today we're talking about if you just want to get your feet wet, you want to explore things in the, in the nations where maybe you have translators on the ground that you can help work with and just get an experience in the culture and still reach and touch people. Like there's so many opportunities to do that on a short-term basis. And if God marks you for that place or marks you for that region or marks you for that type of ministry, uh, then you do need some more training. I'm not convinced you need eight years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think you need eight years unless you like need some crazy uh, Bible translation skills or something. Um, like actually in the room here right now, we have a guy who's been missionary in Turkey and he knows, okay, it's probably a two year process where you need to learn the language. And that's very real. The first two years there on the ground, that's, that's, uh, it's going to be very difficult to be effective without learning the language. Okay. That's totally real. But before that, uh, getting your feet wet and knowing, okay, is Turkey the place? Yeah. Is that a thing? Is whatever. Spend two weeks there, spend a year there. Right. And yeah, like don't go and and do eight years of training Mm -hmm. to then show up and say, wow, this is actually not the type of missionary I'm supposed Mm -hmm. to be or not the right place. Right. But, but even more than that, it's lowering this barrier to missions for people where it's like, you don't have to commit to eight years of study and a lifetime of missions to try out or to, to walk into this God, am I supposed to be a missionary? Right. And I, I think there's, we could unpack. There's a lot of reasons for that change, but bringing it closer to home, Youth with a Mission started 60 years ago about mm-hmm. um, Lauren Cunningham, our founder. Uh, I want to talk about that for a second. Like what yeah. is YWAM? What is, what, how does YWAM engage this missions question? And how does YWAM, how does YWAM help people become missionaries? Right. What, what does that look like? Um, and I know maybe for you and I, we understand why when we're Youth with a Mission a little bit more, but maybe for some of those out there who don't, as much. What can you share with me? Like yeah. some of the story of how YWAM approached missions differently. Yeah. No, for sure. And you add in this one as well, bro. Um, yeah. So it, it just what kind of the scenario I just laid out was the norm. And so Lauren had this picture God gave him. He calls it a movie. <laughs> <laughs> Biblically, it's probably a vision um, of where he saw the whole earth and he saw waves crashing on the shores of these nations across the globe and these waves were young people and so he god spoke that to him showed him that and uh and he realized oh wow i want to uh, or the lord wants to and he's commissioning me to make a way for young people um to go to the nations um and so he started this journey with Youth with a Mission, and really the whole goal with Youth with a Mission, it's young people mostly, mm-hmm. and young at heart. There's there's a lot of not young people here too. <laughs> That's um, true. But really, it's a uh, it's a movement now around the world that has 190 locations or 100 locations in 190 countries around the world. Like 1,100. I hear different numbers. 1,100 locations, over a thousand locations, loads all over, and yeah, and it's 
it's right now in our current day, the idea of young people going to doing missions is kind of like, yeah, cool. Like, yes, go do. It, it's not as weird. But back then, years ago, it would have been crazy. Like, no one did that. You're going to ruin it for the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, for the ones that are l- doing this long term, that are, and uh, every once in a while, young people do ruin stuff, right? <laughs> but true. the benefit of, of, literally thousands, tens of thousands actually, of young people every year going out to these nations, not only reaching the nations that they're helping, you know, being a catalyzing the long-term stuff on the ground, but also them themselves being marked for missions and a percentage of them get called long-term. That way outweighs the negatives of here and there, oh man, you guys didn't do this type of ministry right on the ground because you didn't have experience with that thing. And that's why we work, work with long-termers on the ground uh, to help with all that. So it is a win-win across the board. So, yeah. And, uh, the, within the training, the discipleship training school within YWAM, uh, do you know the number of how many people have gone through it since it started? Like, I think it's in the millions. Yeah. I think it's over 5 million. Yeah. I think it's over 5 million. Yeah. One of our guys here in the room is like <laughs> five people have gone through it. Five, people. Second, five million, <laughs> five million, I think actually have gone over the last 60 years, which is Pretty impressive, actually. And like, just to explain what that is, discipleship training school is essentially training for missions. I mean, you talked about that eight years of training before. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think this there's a question maybe we'll head there here in a minute. How much training does a missionary need? And maybe we could say, you know, eight years is on the the steep end of how much training they need. You know, in this scenario, you're talking like three months of training, mm-hmm. and then three months of basically on the job trainer going and doing missions, but mm-hmm. with a lot of uh, like the training wheels on, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's real missions. And so w- with that 5 million people that are actually going overseas and actually engaging in, you know, sharing the gospel of missions yeah. Yeah. in a, a, a small way. But when you, when you do that, it does a couple of things. It changes like people's perspective internally on their role in missions. Dan Bauman last week said, you know, the question isn't, I asked him, like, we talked about calling and there's this question of like, you don't need a calling. We're all missionaries. We're all mm-hmm. called to share the gospel. Mm-hmm. And by saying like, I'm not called to be a missionary, you're kind of like letting yourself off the hook mm-hmm. with like being a Christian, right. being like someone who shares your faith. Right. And so I think in that same sense, when someone does that three months of training, three months overseas, even if they don't end up being a missionary mm-hmm. in a full-time cross-cultural setting, mm-hmm. they end up coming back and saying, wait a minute. Like I'm going to go work in the workplace, but Mm -hmm. I'm a missionary and I have a role there and I need to see, you know, my, the people are in my circles Mm -hmm. as opportunities to influence. And I think to me, that's like part of the, we asked, why don't we have enough missionaries? I think we have all Christians are missionaries. Why don't we, why aren't people engaging it? Why aren't people going there? And again, if you have eight years of training as your piece, right. then it's just steep. But if you switch it around and say, let's do three months of training, let's do six months of training. It's like becoming a doctor versus like, sure, I'll go. Yeah, I can I can give three months or six months. Yeah, I can learn how <laughs> to do CPR. I can learn how yeah, to... Yeah, yeah, right. I have a first aid kit in my car. Exactly. No. That's, that's about the difference, right? <laughs> but but that's what we're called to. Mm-hmm. And, and as Christians, you don't need to be a doctor to offer life to someone. Right. Um, now, I do think you need someone to show you how to do CPR. You're like, I just saw it in a movie. Here I am. Like, it's good to get some <laughs> I know training. I put a Band-Aid on. I, hey, I can do that. So I think that's, and that's a, for me, that's a really interesting question. You know, how much training do missionaries need? Like, what what do you think? What's the, we talked about it not being eight years. Like, mm-hmm. what is, a, if let's say all Christians are missionaries, what kind mm-hmm. of training do you need? If you're going to be a vocational missionary, what kind of training do you need as just a Christian who's right. missional? Yeah, I mean, it's not a cut and dry answer, obviously. Um, I think it reflects back on where you're ending up. Exactly. It's the bigger picture. But I think as a starting point, I'll just say for from my experience, Youth with a Mission, in our core training that we have people go and go through is the Discipleship Training School. Um, We found that having three months, 12 weeks of foundational teaching on um, not only how to do missions, but who is God, getting to know him, <laughs> ba- you know, basic things like walking in relationship with him. What does it look like to pray, read the word, hear his voice, y- you know, that kind of stuff, as well as share your faith, disciple someone. And we've found that 12 weeks, um, what it allows is in cross-cultural training to some capacity as well. It, it allows, okay, like if if their relationship with God is is 
wherever it's at coming into that, at the end of 12 weeks, for the most part, they're ready, they're amped, they love Jesus more, and they have some tools in their tool belt at least to succeed on the ground within a team and an environment with long-term workers that know what they're doing. Um, so I'd say that that's what we've done as an entry point with foundational training. Um, and then I think as you're getting farther along and you... It goes you, from there. Yeah, it develops. Goes from there. Yeah, you meet someone who's running an orphanage. Okay, what does it take to run an orphanage? Yeah. Okay, you might need some some skill sets in particular categories. Uh, it's not just holding babies. There's other categories as well that go into running an orphanage probably, right? And uh, Or if you join another team, like you may have a particular gift. They may have four other gifts. Um, so maybe you don't need any additional training. You can just join that team. It totally That's, varies. What I love about YWAM, like this is and for some of you may not be aware of this is like after doing that six month discipleship training school, you can be a missionary with YWAM anywhere in the world. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you apply and there's a process there, but like it's six months of training and you can be a missionary. And, right. and for some mission roles, that's sort of like the main training you need. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're serving, um, in a kitchen capacity mm -hmm. and supporting, you know, like here at this, at this location, we've got all kinds of stuff happening here and including the schools and that kind of stuff. Like you could be serving God in a significant way in missions right. by cooking food and like, yeah, you need to encounter God and yeah, you're a part of this community in a larger way, but you don't need to go to a school to like serve God well, in a missions capacity. I, I would need to go to a school if I'm going to serve <laughs> in the kitchen. Let's okay. just be real. That's true. I need a couple years of training. But, but even having <laughs> somebody in the kitchen that could show you how to do yeah, it. Yeah, I know. Totally. And, and that's the approach that YWAM takes. Now, is there more training available Absolutely. You, like we offer the school of biblical studies. I don't know how long it is here. It's nine months, nine yeah. months of studying the Bible, reading through the Bible multiple times, really understanding what is this incredible book that God gave us. Um, but you can go do a frontier mission school. You can go do, I mean, the, there's so many yeah. schools, worship media. Yeah. There's a YWAM kinds. is not saying go do this many years or this approach is like a traditional setup. Mm -hmm. It's more like, you got in, you did the six month school, you're here now. Mm -hmm. What role are you going to play? Where is God calling you to be? And like, if he's calling you to go to, you know, Thailand, mm -hmm. then maybe you should take a school to prepare you to go there. Right. But you don't have to make that call before you do a DTS or right. before you staff at a, a YWAM location. Yeah, yeah. So it, that question of how much training do you need? In a lot of ways, it's like, well, what are you, what are you supposed to do and where are you supposed mm -hmm. to do it? And you don't have to answer all that up front. You can mm -hmm. answer that as you go. And that, that's the way we do it within this movement, mm -hmm. youth, youth with a mission mm -hmm. real quick. Just explain to me like all those locations around the world. What is, what is the, um, what are the things that like hold us together and like, what's maybe mm -hmm. a, a miss misnomers? I, I've, <laughs> I, I have one that I'm thinking of. Okay. Like I think a lot of people think YWAM is an organization uh -huh. that, that we're all tied together and we have a CEO and somebody who's mm -hmm. calling the shots and making sure of the headquarters. Yeah. yeah. And what many people don't realize is that that's not the case. Um, we're, we're set up in such a way that every location is independently operated, but there's a connection of values and it's a movement mm -hmm. and we're relationally tied together. Right. And there are some things you'd find every, everywhere you go within YWAM, mm -hmm. this, the, t the discipleship training school, mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that's, I don't know. What else would you say about like why women, yeah. somebody that doesn't know? I would say though it's called an organization, it's really a movement. So it's a movement of missions around the world. That's super diverse. The way that why wham, cause once you do a DTS, you are officially a YWAMer and you can actually go and apply to any location around the world. They have to accept you and whatever. But, um, YWAM is really held together, like you said, by values. So there's 18 core values that are straight from the Bible and um, as well as relationally. So yeah. like everyone in YWAM is probably about one relationship away from another person, <laughs> if not directly related. And there's over 20,000 of us around the world. So that's pretty wild, actually. Yeah. Um, I, and more if you consider those who are <clears throat> maybe not in a full-time capacity. Yeah. I mean, there's even a lot of ministries out there that – if you, if you just do a little bit of digging, you realize that the, the people who started that and run that ministry yeah. are YWAMers. Yeah. Loads the of them. The ministry doesn't say YWAM on the website, right. but... Well, it's a family of ministries as well. Literally, there's thousands of ministries underneath the umbrella of YWAM directly 
that you would never know is YWAM. And there's millions of people that have gone through YWAM that have started their own things that aren't underneath the umbrella of YWAM, where if you find out, oh, you did YWAM? Where did you do your DTS? And you just have connection right there. I just was in a conversation yesterday with somebody. We're talking, oh, that guy's a YWAMer? Hilarious, you know? Yeah. He's leading this large movement in America. Um, and so you, you have some of that where I always tell people, if you feel called to mission in some capacity, I think there's almost no loss to do with ETS is yeah. how I say it because the door opens to you. Uh, to, the whole planet opens to you, basically. The door opens there as well as You all of a sudden get connections ministries. everywhere. Literally. You just say, <laughs> I did like, oh, YWAM there. you done the Literally. And um, so it's, it's uh, you know, I, I have a couch to sleep on in I don't know how many countries from a direct friend or probably every country from a friend of a friend. Yeah. And they found out, oh, you're YWAM? You're in Kansas City? Come on, I'm in Romania, sleep on my couch. You know, like whatever. I've actually, I had a friend who like backpacked across Europe and stayed at YWAM bases like all across Europe and mm -hmm. was just like, so yeah, it's a huge family and it is, I think, such a low barrier to entry. I mean, mm -hmm. six months is so little amount of time. And I would say that I think probably a lot of our audience on this channel um, or on this video, particularly that click through this one, maybe you're interested in missions, but even if you're not going to be a missionary, if you have no intention or you, know, you have no thought that that would be where you're headed, it's just still giving you an under, understanding of who you are, how to approach God, it, but it also helps you understand mission within the context of your local community. Mm -hmm. And I think most believers would agree with the fact that, oh, I'm a missionary in my hometown. Or I, I, like most people wouldn't say, I'm not a missionary. They would say, no, I'm a I'm missional. Or I live here and I'm a missionary here. But like, what does that look like? How do mm -hmm. you do that? How do mm -hmm. you share the gospel in a relational way? How do you live as a witness and like, are you actually free in your own life? Is Jesus, like if, if you took you and, repl and, and duplicated you a hundred times or everyone on the earth, what kind of shape would we be in? Right. And right. so I think DTS is not just about, yeah, being able to share the gospel. It's also about you know, really going somewhere with yeah, God for that, sure. that changes the trajectory of your life. No, hundred percent. Whether it's missions or not. Yeah. No, I mean, we got guys that come through all the time that this, they point to this as really a starting place in their walk with Jesus of moving from being a spectator to being a participant, moving from being someone in the stands to being a player on the field. Like they learn, oh my gosh, like God can use me. And and also that I can walk in freedom in that category. I didn't even know that. Or I have had trouble reading the Bible. Oh my goodness, here's some tools to help me read. There's so many areas like that where, where I can be missional wherever I am. I was just in a meeting right before this podcast actually. Um, one of the guys in the meeting is a local pastor. He was on staff with YWAM for a number of years, and now he's doing local outreach events right here in our neighborhoods that we're partnering with. And uh, But he's got that at the core of who he is. He's got that YWAM DNA where he fell in love with Jesus, and he learned how to be on mission in his life. And um, and now he's locally and there's another person in the room that, you know, it's a very similar kind of storyline and they're just missional on their street and they just are reaching out to the neighbors with whatever it could be cookies or, <laughs> you know, I don't yeah. know what it is, but, um, and so it can, it can look like a lot of things. Yeah, totally. Well, let's look over to some of the questions we got in from mm -hmm. our Instagram audience. Yeah. If you aren't following us on Instagram, you should totally do that. We're, we're posting, uh, we're going to start posting there before we do podcasts, asking for your questions. So if you want to jump into this conversation, do that with us. You can also comment down below mm -hmm. um, wherever you're watching this and um, be, engage with us in that conversation. And uh, yeah, so here's some of the questions we got. Let's see if we can like hey. plow through these because some of these we could spend like <laughs> an hour on. Yeah. yeah. So like, so, so we're looking at rapid fire kind of just real quick yeah okay cool. we'll try yeah so forever we'll try. for his glory says what are some of the emotions slash expectations someone should expect in the first year doing missions some some emotions and, and expectations, expectations yeah. in the first year of being a missionary and by the way it's not me just answering these it's you yeah, too. okay let's do it um yeah i would say first year um be open to be <laughs> pushed out of your comfort zone i'd say that's a really common one where a lot of guys come in and they're experiencing a lot of new things, whether it's new things from scripture they've never heard, uh, new areas where they're being pushed to be more bold for Jesus and getting set free from fear of man, passivity, whatever it might be, new experiences of culture. Um, I would say where, all right, you're not going to be necessarily sleeping in a sleep number bed when you're in the nations. <laughs> or, <laughs> or here. Or, or, have, or here, yeah, even, yeah, right. <laughs> 
Um, you know, you're not going to have, we have good accommodations here. We do have good accommodations, <laughs> but it's not a sleep number. Mattress. It's not a sleep number. We're, we're, we're trying to get there though. We're close. Um, but, or food, like you're not going to have your favorite hamburger down the you street. You might eat rice every day on outreach. You literally might have rice every single day or some other. That's like a classic delicacy. <laughs> yeah. Outreach experience. Um, so, or new noises, new smells, new coach like being stretched being stretched i'd say get out of your comfort zone and being stretched those would be some really um good expectations coming in as well as i think you'll find some of your best friends that you've ever met in your entire life because i would just say often it, it becomes normal to have surface level relationships with people not in purpose but just sometimes it just happens that way where in this context i think you're forced to go after God in a way, just because that's what you're here for, yeah. that you really get to know people on a deep level and you get to experience God together. You get to experience, I mean, crazy stuff on outreach that's so amazing as well yeah. as maybe difficult in other categories too. But through the amazing and the difficult, you get to bond with people on a, on a pretty significant level. So I think one expectation to have coming in would be that this experience is not gonna be about you and that you're that's gonna good. struggle that is not gonna be fun all the time or warm fuzzies, that you're gonna learn some stuff about yourself that maybe isn't the most fun to learn. But like, I think we're, as a culture, we're so consumer-based and we're so much like, what do you want? How do I give it to you? Sure. And, I, like, and I think as Christians, we're called to lay down our rights, lay down mm -hmm. who we are before the Lord. And I think this getting into missions, it, it does that. Mm -hmm. It creates those opportunities where you're like, relationally your roommate or with finances or with whatever it is, all of a sudden you're in this spot where you're just like, wow, I'm not like, this isn't all about me and I'm not getting everything that I want. But what you are getting is Jesus. What you are getting is, is sort of like a, a, you're getting thrown into the mix and you all of a sudden have to ask yourself, am I going to jump in and go for this? Mm -hmm. Or am I going to kind of back out? And I think as Christians going to church every Sunday, that question doesn't feel as present mm -hmm. all the time. It's there, mm -hmm. 100%. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to do a DTS to follow Jesus radically. But when totally. you're in this sort of situation of doing missions, whether you're with YWAM or elsewhere, I think it brings some of those like challenges to the forefront. Mm -hmm. So I'd say guts and glory would be a good way to summarize it. Yeah. There's always, it, it, it is good it's and real. bad. It's not, yeah, it's guts and glory. Um, how did you know you were called to be a missionary? Uh, same user asked this question. Okay. I'll, I'll give a short answer this time. <laughs> I didn't give a short answer the last time. Um, Writing on the wall. Yeah, yeah. Audible voice. Yeah, yeah. Michael the Archangel just <laughs> at night, 3 a.m. No, I'm just playing. Um, I would say I, I would say I felt more, um, well, I may be a little weird. So I grew up as a missionary kid and a pastor's kid. So I had a desire actually in my heart from a very young age because I was exposed to some stuff. So I would say a short answer was just being exposed to mission stuff. And when I got a little bit older too, I was exposed to some more where I was personally more like kind of involved. That's what actually marked me. When I saw someone who was hurting, when I saw someone that needed Jesus, when I saw God move in that way and he could use me, I think in the midst of that, God just, he gave me his heart and his burden for the nations. And there's a more detailed version of that, but I'd say generally it was being exposed to it and then seeing him move and use me. Those are probably kind of the two main ways um, I felt called into missions. Yeah, for me, I, I did feel called into missions, I think, in a way, but I don't know if I would say it was like a calling in the traditional sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, missions was on my heart for years, mm -hmm. and I just constantly asked the Lord, is it time? Are you mm -hmm. wanting me to go? And um, I think looking back, I, re I realized now that I wasn't saying yes to his call to be a missionary right where I was to the same degree. But yeah, there, there is that sense of like, okay, God, um, I'm feeling led to move somewhere. It wasn't like super clear, mm -hmm. um, but I was interested enough that I was just like, I'm just going to go for mm -hmm. it and mm -hmm. see what happens. And he was in it, but yeah, I don't think it was like a thus saith the Lord. Yeah, or, thunder, thunderbolt yeah. moment. Yeah, and I think it's good that we say that because I think being led by God in general in life and what we're called called to do, we use that word called a lot, um, it, it is really the kingdom is operated by faith. And so I don't. I think it's good to demystify some of that stuff where um, God's called us to all be missional. It's really just okay. We're discover. It's almost a discovery process sometimes of what that looks like in now, what context. I would pursue that like where is God leading me, but I would do it from the angle of like I'm going to go 
jump in. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm not going to wait from, on the side. I'm just going to sit here for three years waiting for God's call. It's easier to steer a moving vehicle than it I is. I mean, God puts these passions yeah. in our heart, and if there's an interest there, I mean, yeah. If you have a desire to, you know, serve the poor in some place, it's probably not the devil <laughs> speaking to you or <laughs> your flesh. It's Use the sermon, Jesus. you know. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're not going to make you through all these questions if we don't keep going. Let's okay. Char Lest. 938 says, how do I know which country God wants to send me to? Kind of the same question we yep. just talked about. I think you get into it, you know, and I think trying to figure that out from your hometown, a bit challenging. I would suggest come do a DTS <laughs> and who knows, maybe it'll stir it up there. Maybe not go to a local church on a short-term trip. Mm -hmm. um, put yourself into context. Talk to missionaries. I think those are... Yeah, it's just add know. real quick. Yeah. I people would always ask me that. I felt called to missions, and they'd say, "What, what, what country? Where?" And I always was confused because I was always ask God, "What country?" And uh, and I realized I have a little bit more of a global call, but literally you could name any country right now, and I'd be stoked about going there. Yeah. <laughs> and Nowhere I, in the Bible does God say <laughs> you need to go to a country, one country. Yeah. <laughs> and, and even in the New Testament, for the most part, most of the missionaries we see, they're going around. They're going around. Yeah. Paul's skipping around and he's Macedonia here and Thessalonica Come on, Paul, there. commit. Why, yeah, why hey. can't you just stick with one church? And then there's long-termers on the ground in those places as well. So yeah, it's both. Um, Sam Zion Park says, do I need to feel called to missions or ministry? or certain nation, same question, answered that. What does a typical week look like? Uh, Hannah Ma Brook asks. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I butchered your name. Oh yeah, <laughs> Hannah. Um, <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> some of these questions are hard. It depends if you're talking about, on a broader sense, a, every country, every yeah. context is so different. Totally. Or if you're talking about like a DTS week, like those are two different questions. So I'll let you throw in. Yeah. So, I mean, like being in Norway, I mean, I feel like God led us to do media as missions. And so, you know, it looks similar. I worked outside of missions um, in a media context and it looks kind of similar, like working in an office, that, that kind of thing. The, the thing that was interesting that would be different than my job in the U.S. with the typical week is that Wyomers are constantly like going places and traveling and doing things. So like opportunities to, to like hop on a plane and go to another country or to go down the street and do ministry. Like I would say it's less of like a, you're stuck in an office and more of like a constant adventure with all these random things happening around you. And so there is some of that office feel to it definitely. But then like very quickly it shifts to like, Oh, I'm in a prayer meeting or worshiping God, you know, more than I typically would, or yeah, I'm going in the streets or whatever. Yeah. And <clears throat> again, it's such a broad question. I'll really just, depends I'll on where you're at. There. Yeah. Depending on what country you're in. Um, we got the same similar questions again. Uh, here's another one. Havala uh, Mishler says, do you have any advice for couples going to be missionaries together? Good question. I'm Bo married. Both of us You're are married. married. Yeah. So um, <laughs> we're both missionaries. Yeah. I, I have a, c a couple nuggets I'll keep short and I'm sure you do as yeah. well. Um, I would say, first off, you can't just have one person who's super burdened for something and the other one is not on board. That is uh, not going to work. Um, you really need clarity from Jesus as a unit. If you're already married, then they are the one. So you're with them <laughs> either. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't believe in the one until you're married. Then you have the one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so yeah, you're, you're married and you're married for life. Right. And so if you're not yet married or if you're just like early on a relationship, then I think there is still negotiability in terms of it's a big conversation calling. to it's have a big conversation. My wife and I actually had some of those conversations where she was in missions me as well. So we are already on the missions track. So that wasn't difficult there, but where we did it, how we did it. Um, that was actually some of our hardest conversations as we were in the process of uh, relationship, getting engaged. Um, those are some very difficult conversations. And you've um, got it all figured out now. So you'd have no more conversations. We do have live. this season. We have this season figured out and what the Lord's saying over it. Um, but I would say you've got to be in unity. I would say is number one. And then I think, um, as a, as a couple or a family, and you could probably speak more to the family, you have more kids than me, um, you want to be, I, I was going back to some of the stuff we said earlier, try stuff out, maybe don't commit 20 years to some movement in a place you've never been or never experienced, like get on the ground, give yourself some time to, to, to feel it out a little bit, and, uh, and don't um, throw yourself maybe so far into it that you get there and it's like nothing you expect and it's not what you feel at all. And so I'd say um, giving yourself room to explore and try things. Yeah, totally. I, I would say the unity piece is huge. 
And I think for me, I've realized even being in missions that it's God's heart for us to be unified Mm -hmm. as husband and wife and uh, recognizing that we're different people with different outlooks on our world, on what our really? ideal would be. You guys actually have some yeah, differences have some in your differences. marriage? That's we crazy. Some big ones, <laughs> actually. Uh, but it, it's real. And I think you, it, you, the point isn't either they're right or you're right. The point is that God put something different in both of you and it's supposed to go together. Mm-hmm. And to me, again, we already asked this question, or we already talked about the fact that we're all called to be missionaries. The mm-hmm. question is where and when and how. And so for me, I think a big question for either both, probably both of the, in, in the relationship is, do you trust God? Mm-hmm. Are you willing to surrender your life mm-hmm. to God? Do you believe mm-hmm. that he's good enough to give permission to him to lead your family, to lead you? Mm-hmm. And I would say oftentimes when you have disunity, it comes around a fear or a, an, like, I don't want to trust God to lead me here or to do that thing. And so I think that's, in my mind, like before you're getting to this question of how are we going to minister or how are we going to be used by God, it's a question of am I willing to let God be good to me? Right. Do I trust God? And I think uh, that's a wonderful conversation to have mm-hmm. as a couple mm-hmm. um, with individually with the Lord and then together right. um, of saying, God, we trust you with our family. We trust right. you with our marriage. We trust you with where we live and, and what we're doing. Um, and if both are trusting one might be more uncomfortable than the other mm-hmm. in, a, in a certain context, mm-hmm. but in the end it's about following Jesus, right. not about looking a certain way. Right. So, no. amen. So good, bro. Um, and I'll just add 10 seconds real quick to that. My, my questions. wife was on the way to, um, basically move to Uganda before we got married. She was in the planning phases for that to work with some South Sudanese refugees and um, we're not doing that right now, and we're married now and all this kind of thing. I have something in my heart towards Africa as well. I don't know what that looks like, but I've had a sense something there in the in the future. Mm-hmm. And so that's something like you're saying, trusting God, where we submitted that to Jesus and said, okay, Lord, we feel like this is the season we're in, and uh, some of those things in her heart for Africa and mine and other places globally as well, we're trusting you with what it looks like, the timing, timing how much we're involved, huge. if we're there on the ground, if we're not on the ground, like the version of it, we've submitted it to him. And uh, and we've seen God already bring some of that stuff forth and some of it's still on the shelf and we're just, we're obedient to the now and the season we're in now. So Yeah, I think open hands with what you feel like God's led you to as an individual and letting God, I think for me, I didn't realize that I was going into missions as a single person. Mm -hmm. I was married and I had kids, but I was thinking of myself and Uh and my calling as a single person and realizing that God has a call, that we're using that word again, call, like God is leading your family somewhere Mm -hmm. and it's not just about you as that single missionary anymore. Um, And I think that's wonderful, but yeah, it definitely, I I think it complicates it, but it also gives you such a balance and such a health. If you can get the, the places you disagree to come in unity under the obedience of Jesus, mm-hmm. a beautiful place. And then, you know, you're in a position where you're both being stretched. You're both willing to, mm-hmm. to go. So I think it's, a, it, it can be an, a, a wonderful thing. Mm-hmm. Even when, if you feel like we're in an impossible mm-hmm. match mm-hmm. F- in terms of ministry, mm-hmm. um, I think there's tons of hope there. Yeah. Amen. Um, when you follow Jesus. So any more uh, last question, Okay, how do you start newsletters and fundraise? <laughs> We're going to sum that all up for you in one minute. (laughs) (laughs) You will be fully funded at the end of this, this one minute clip. I mean, I think you got to get trained and this is again, the, the training piece that we talked about earlier, how much training do you need Mm -hmm. is a, is a huge question. I would say that the funding can also go hand in hand with that. Sometimes you can be like, it's overwhelming to fund a career in missions. Um, It's a lot of work, Um, but I think the starting point can be, yeah, doing like a six month version mm-hmm. of it and um, asking the Lord to provide and funding for that. I mean, I think God, if God's leading you to missions, mm-hmm. he's going to provide for it. Um, but there's a partnership there mm-hmm. and a lot of training that I would like, if you're going to go and be a missionary and you think you can just do it, you know, off of your personality, like right. you need some training. <laughs> no, no, for sure. And yeah. And I think that training would be, I'd say a key and, and also misconceptions as well. So you want to have the biblical foundation there for for what God says about that, and then actually training to do it. And it's totally possible. I mean, I've been 11 years full-time missions. You know, now I'm married with a kid, second kid on the way. You have multiple kids. You're ahead of me. We're trying to catch up. Um, <laughs> and the Lord's totally provided. We travel quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and it's 
just to say it's it's possible and there's thousands, actually 20 plus thousand Wyomers globally that do it. And, uh, and I would say, yeah, just take the time. I'd say if you give yourself to it, you can do it in months where you actually get funded. Um, but it depends on the pace you go, but I, having the, the skill sets and just the understanding of how to, uh, have that support system around you in a way that they're partnered with you and what God's doing in the nations. Um, there's just, there are a few things to learn. Yeah. I think in real short form, it's about bringing people into the mission that God's called you on. Mm -hmm. That's what the newsletters looks like. That's what the fundraising looks like Mm -hmm. is it's relationally engaging people and inviting them to join you in this call. And I think in the same sense of we're waiting on God to tell us what to do, we can ask God to tell our funders if they're Mm -hmm. supposed to fund us. And, um, so that's what, that's what a newsletter looks like yeah. too. It's just like, here's what God's doing right. and be praying for us. Yeah. And they're a part of the, what you're doing. Yeah. I'll add something to the newsletter thing, just cause I've been around missions a while. I think a lot of people's version of, uh, support raising or having a team around you that really partners with you is you send out one letter to 200 people and two people get back to you and God didn't fund me. Uh, I'll just say that's cause I don't know. I don't know if that's in the question, but it could be. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd say that's, it's, if that happened in any other scenario, it'd be like, well, I don't know if that was God didn't fund you as much as, I don't know if that's the most effective way to actually Strategy, communicate yeah. vision to people and communicate a way for them to be involved. Maybe that's one way, but I think, um, how would you bring someone into anything that you cared about or that's deeply personal? You would do it in a very personal way. You do it in, in a way that's very honoring to them. And so I think that's kind of the classic missions thing, like, Two hundred letters. Two people got back. Well, guess I'm not a missionary. You're like, God all didn't right. call me. I know. I'm like, all right, bro. We can we can do this. Let's What's your favorite book on fundraising? Um, do you have one, or what would you? Yeah. What resources so I've read a few to? actually, and we have courses here in our campus now. Um, one, I'd just say Fully Funded Missionary by Rob Parker. Yeah. And that's the one we've had him even personally come in and train our staff, and a number of our staff have got fully funded off that, and a number of our other staff are working on it uh, with him as well. So I'd say Rob Parker, fully funded missionary. He even has e-courses that literally walk you step by step that are very reasonable um, cost. And um, we're even a, an affiliate of his or we're becoming an affiliate of his. Cool. And so he's he's our favorite too. I've read a few other ones that are pretty yeah. good. His is the most practical, like here's how to do it well. Here's how to do it in an honoring way. And it's the most thorough as well. So Awesome. Love it. That I think may be a topic we need to revisit in probably a deeper way. In the we future. had Rob on the podcast a couple times. Oh, actually, wow. we nice. did. Yeah. So I think before you came, or it was maybe yeah, right around okay. the same time you came on staff here. Um, so you can go back and check those out. And those we'll put them just, in the description. Yeah, and those are just starter starter okay. uh, combos. One was I think just broader. Uh, how does God see this thing? And then the second one had a few practicals in it. Um, so, but we can have him back on. He, totally. he lives in Kansas City, actually. So it's, oh, nice. it's a huge blessing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, huge, huge topic. Mm-hmm. Um, like final word on that. Don't let finances For stop sure. you from what God is leading you to. Um, find a way. There is a way that God's going to provide if he's leading you that right. direction. Don't be led by um, money. Yeah. Be led by Jesus. Absolutely. Yeah. And you can do it healthy and you don't have to be like starving missionary. Right. I don't think that's what God's calling us to. Um, Paul did say, I know what it is like to have plenty and have lack. Mm -hmm. So it's not to say that there won't be challenges financially, but the Lord provides for us Mm -hmm. in abundance. He's a good father. So he takes care of the birds. He'll take care of us. That's right. It's a few parts in the Bible there. That's right. So Mm -hmm. um, as we get closer to the end of this conversation, uh, can you just share with me, I'm still learning what's happening here. Can you share with me kind of what is YWAM Kansas City look like? like uh, this is a conversation we're going to go forward with. We're not going to mm-hmm. explain all this today, but give me a little taste of like what what ministries are here mm-hmm. and what kinds of things. Do Save we this do? one for last time. Huh? <laughs> um, don't don't like feel the need to explain every single sure. one of them. But, okay, okay. But yeah, there's a lot happening here. Yeah, okay. You know, give it to us. Um, okay, sure. Yeah, kind of summarized version here. So YWAM Kansas City. We're located in Kansas City. Part of Youth of the Mission, obviously. Um, I, there's we have a 40 acre campus here, where there's six different ministries that function out of here that are a family of ministries. So, you know, we've got a ministry 10 feet that way, another 20 feet that way. You know, so we're in a, an office building all that's together. shared all together. Yeah, 
and uh, and each ministry has their own focus. So some are focused on using arts, entertainment, and sports as a way to preach the gospel to the next yeah, generation impact world. in a relevant way. Yeah, so Impact World to be the movement, and then there's individual ministries, um, Island Breeze, and GX, GX. International. Uh, yes, Island Breeze is they use Polynesian dance and the island culture to to do that and present that. If you guys have ever seen fire knife dances and those things, those are kind of what those guys do. Uh, GX International they use primarily dance, but other expressions as well, and uh, often hip hop dances are top way and rap and other things. And then Team Extreme uses a blend of martial arts, strength feats, sometimes rap as well. And, um, so those are some ministries. It's all about there. sharing the gospel. They're yep. they're doing entertainment and bringing a crowd together anywhere, anywhere around the world. So and everything, then everywhere Jesus. from a stadium to a neighborhood outreach, which uh, we were just planning some this morning, actually. Cool. So um, so those guys travel a lot, do that kind of stuff a lot. It's really awesome. Uh, we have another ministry on campus here called the 111 Global. They're a worship. Um, I'd say they have several locations around the world that they've helped plant as well and resource. Um, and so they focus on prayer and worship around the world. Planting houses of prayer, training Houses up. of prayer and just the everyday believer. They uh, look at scriptures uh, all over in Isaiah and different places. Malachi 1.11 is their, yeah. their core verse that their ministry is based off of, where you see in the Bible that, at, you know, globally there's going to be worship and song singing to Jesus uh, at the end of the day when he comes back, and that's one of their goals is to see that happen and equip people in that, the heart piece for that, as well as the skill. Um, and then and, we've got Call to All. Yeah, Call, call to All as well. So um, this is a ministry that's not necessarily under the YWAM umbrella, but Located we're all family here, yeah. ministries here. And so they work with all kinds of organizations. They've done 30 what they call congresses around the world where they've gathered over 60,000 missions leaders. And uh, where they put in front of them the finish lines of what we call the gospel. Maybe this is a little too deep for people. I'm not Great sure. Great commission. Great commission. So reach, praying for every single person, reaching them with the gospel, Bible engagement, discipleship, compassion, you know. Um, and all these ministries gather in a geographic region. Um, let's say Nepal, they did one. Seoul, Korea, they did one. Yeah. Brazil was the most recent one um, where they actually mapped out all the unreached tribes and villages in the Amazon. And uh, all these ministries came together in Brazil, and they adopt adopted all these unreached areas in these different finish lines that their ministry already works in. Totally. And so that's what they do. And they have another initiative of that, uh, which is another team here called All America, which is an initiative of Call to All that's in America, um, where they their goal is to pray for everyone and reach everyone uh, in in America. Um, so that's so pretty quite cool. a lot happening here. And then you have Wyoming, Kansas City in the traditional sense, um, which I'm more directly involved in as a full-time thing, where we run training schools and we have- and Discipleship training schools. Discipleship training, Bible ones, worship ones, different ones. And, um, and it's primarily a training ministry, um, but we also help with all the other categories as well. And we have a few locations we've planted around the world. So we have three other sister campuses, YWAM campuses in South America and Asia. So Cool. Yeah. So we're just summarizing. It's, it's training missionaries, uh, recruiting and training. There's also mobilizing the church, engaging the church to, to come together and unify mm -hmm. around sharing the gospel, the Great Commission. Mm -hmm. There's actually and then the expression of sharing the gospel. So there's a lot of stuff happening here and we're going to get into more of that in future podcasts and kind yeah, of start no, to I, unpack some of that those probably things. just went right over a lot of people's head. They're like, it's good to have like I lost short... you at the, the dancer, the one who spins yeah. on his head. After that, I lost everything else you said. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm still learning what's happening here and there's some really cool stuff and we're going to go into it and, but it was a good conversation today. Yeah, come on, man. I think the the ending point here is we have a school in January, the Discipleship Training School. We do. If you are like, you know what? And April and July. And July. And we have them four times a year. If you're feeling like, you know what? I'm not sure if I'm called to be a missionary or I am sure or I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do next year. Like just apply. We'll put a link down below. Just apply and we'll like get on the phone with you and pray with you. Like no pressure. We're not going to mm -hmm. like twist your arm into doing something God's mm -hmm. not leading you to, mm -hmm. but we'd love to have that conversation and just start to pray and ask the Lord what he's doing. And, uh, maybe it's just a short season here. Maybe it's something bigger. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But, uh, we love it. And so if that's, if that's you click the link below and Amen. go check it out.
So good, bro. Thanks for uh, yeah. Thanks for thanks collecting for all these me. questions and yeah, it's a fun combo, bro. Look yeah. forward to more. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in to our YWAM Kansas City podcast. If you enjoyed listening, please subscribe, share, and leave a rating. If you are watching, please like, comment, share, and subscribe, and be sure to turn on our post notifications to catch our podcasts as soon as they release. We'll see you next time.